get to the questions. First one, okay, what qualities and capabilities will be necessary for the new generation of leaders to adapt to a society changed by artificial intelligence? Three keywords, please. Okay, let's get this quick. Okay, please allow me to speak Chinese because the China US Youth Leadership Summit. Uh, I think three key words. The first is leadership. Actually, is what we are going to talk about. The second is the future. The third is the future. The fourth is the future. The fifth is the future. The sixth is the future. The seventh is the future. The eighth is the future. Yeah, totally agree with the keyword you mentioned. I would like to totally agree, especially globalization. It's very important, especially now the the tension between U.S. and China give people a wrong impression about you know has to be more localized in terms of running business. But the future is about a global competition, so globalization for sure. Second is insight. We're looking for founder, we're investor, so we're looking for founder with the right insight about how to run the company long term, and also the right insight about the industry. The third is dedication. So when you had a big idea, how to execute it on it, really dedicated to make it happen, that's another thing we're really looking for from founder. Thank you. Only three words? <laughs> All right, okay. I think the three words um, are wisdom, creativity, and flexibility. So I think as I get older, I'm beginning to look at life a little bit differently than I used to. So I'm not worried about technology. I'm not worried about creativity. What worries me is when I look at the young generation, uh, it's their lack of building relationship. And, and I think that as we get closer and stronger with AI, I think that leaders have to be more compassionate they have to remember that the technology is just a mean. It's not the, it's a way, it's not the uh, end uh, goal. So I would love to see the young leaders focus on being analog, compassionate, and also never forget the limits of power. Because AI is great, but on the other hand, it has so many uh, issues that we can discuss later. Yeah, the firstly for me is adaptability. I think the world is changing much faster than, than previously and staying humble um, and constantly uh, looking out f and, and listening for what are the, the newest trends and how do you um, develop around them. I think second for me is self-learning. There's no, I, I think we're way beyond going to college for four years and then forgetting about it. For what I'm doing, the technology, everything we're doing didn't even exist 10 years ago. So I think self-learning um, and staying humble is, is uh, critical. And I, I'd like to support the, the most recent point is relationships. So AI can do a lot, it can automate a lot, um, but I think the need for humans in the equation isn't going away. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, oh, I, that was just an appetizer. Now we get to the main course. The second question, what do you think is the biggest challenge for these young leaders with exponential evolution of technology? You can elaborate on this one for three to five minutes, please. Starting from you. Uh, thank you. Uh, because just now I have already made the uh, speech, so I leave the time to our other guests. Okay. <laughs> 呃，我想说的，刚才已经在我的这个致辞里面都已经表达过了，所以我把时间让给我们的嘉宾。Uh, sure, thank you. And first I, first, I would like to apologize because I know on agenda I'm supposed to have a keynote speaking and then join this panel. I was in another uh, conference in San Francisco and the traffic's really bad between the city and here. That's the reason we need technology innovation to make our traffic and transportation more efficient in the future. So sorry about it. And for the questions, uh, I think there are lots of challenges because we're in the air that many uncertainty is upcoming for the next few years. So I think one challenge for the, this young leader right now, the mentor, young entrepreneur, young policymaker, they have to be able to be determined and also project a, have the right expectation what's going to happen in the future. And if everything is uncertain, how they could make sure they continue with their direction with the uncertainty. 
So that's a strong capability. Another thing is we also are going through this great technology innovation right now. And I met lots of the founder. They're the potential future leader. They want to use technology to really make a big disruptive change in the future. But how to adapt it? Like I agree with the, you just mentioned the adaptivity. We have so many technology, but how to better integrate technology with the industry? Like we have lots of discussion around new technology, including AI. Recently, Stanford launched a human center initiative uh, institution. The main topic is we have to make sure technology is uh, controlled by the right hand, especially for AI. We need to make sure AI is going to empower the existing player in the industry instead of we, we talk about AI going to replace certain jobs. So how to better integrate a new technology with the traditional industry? And these two, peop these two group of people may not talk to each other. Young founders, super energetic, and thinking about the future, they're working on AI. But for like insurance tech, for the healthcare industry, the traditional player, their, their mindset is different. So as an investor, as a founder, as a young leader, we have to take this responsibility to, to shorten the gap and make them talk to each other and better show the capability of new technology and meanwhile increase the, improve the industry efficiency. That's also the topic we discuss a little bit, um, uh, actually discuss a lot in the Davos conference. The, the, the fourth industrial revolution is coming. How are we gonna make it happen? We need to better leverage the technology. Another sad challenge I think we're facing is Related to what I mentioned earlier is about the US and China, this uh, political tension. We used to have this you know, big dream in the Silicon Valley, we're purely maker. We just need to focus on technology, make things happen, instead of thinking what's happening in Washington, DC. Politic politics is not necessarily related to technology innovation. But since last year, everything is about politics. And even for technology, Founder, technology investor, we have to think about what is the potential regulation in the future, no matter for big company or small company, what is the impact going to have for the ecosystem? I feel one thing the whole Silicon Valley did not really do well in the past few years is uh, tech people does not really like talk to policymaker. Feels like you guys don't know technology, we're doing something great here. But the reality is, if we really want to make systematically change, the tech owner has to engage policymaker. We have to empower the policymaker to let them understand what's truly going on with technology innovation, what is the progress of the innovation, and then we could help them make better policy in the future. Well, I think the biggest challenge is that to constantly update one's knowledge about, uh, well, understanding of evolving technologies while also gaining the maturity in relating to people. Uh, what we need to put in mind uh, is that while the evolving technologies um, is now, um, you know, uh, very fast, moving uh, evolves very fast. Uh, people haven't changed much in a million years. You know, human evolution is extremely slow. Um, human humans in a million years ago uh, seems to have quite similar uh, capacities to us. Uh, possibly the gene tech revolution. Um, means that we can now speed up human evolution and direct it. Um, how, however, um, the, the, the fact is that uh, it's still quite controversial. Of course, um, the latent uh, capacity of humans remain largely unchanged, but the actual capacity of a human depends on education. Education has tended to be misunderstood as um, consisting mainly of uh, accumulation of knowledge, in a more recent view, um, as accumulation of skills. I think both views are misguided. The modern brain science enables us to understand education as uh, in-life evolution of individual brains, uh, neural networks. Enhance the knowledge or skills is uh, sort of like um, the symptoms of such development. So then the education for the world now we live in with advanced technologies uh, needs to start with scientific insight, not really based on slogans or politics. So if a person is to secure the leadership role in the AI era, I think uh, having a broad literal arts education <coughs> 
so that someone can be well versed on many subjects and can be intellectually flexible is the key. Um, I don't really think that someone should be pigeonholed into a technical uh, specialty to be a leader. Leaders will need to be well educated, well versed in technical subjects, uh, but also in arts and humanities. Such a person will be able to better adapt into rapidly evolving times. So that's my view on this. Thank you. So when you're the third uh, of the speakers, usually, and you have some wise people speaking before you, usually they cover everything you wanted to say. So uh, first of all, I'd like to echo what I heard here. But again, the, the AI and the machine learning, to me, it's an obvious. It's industry 4.0. So just like the world has gone through the three previous revolutions, I'm sure that we'll manage the fourth one. The challenges that I see have to do with what I call social impact. So for instance, we know about Google doing some AI to do better heart uh, research. Uh, we know that American Express is using it to get better bot support for customers. Uh, we know that we'll be able to do better uh, uh, space research. This is obvious. The challenge is what do we do with the generations of people that suddenly will find themselves out of work? This means that maybe governments will have to look for special taxes and then pour these funding into those people that will lose their jobs. So I think that what I would love to see, again, the younger generation, when they study whether it's mathematics, physics, computer science, I would love to see philosophy and other agendas kind of brought into their agenda of studying. So when they do all the coding, they have to add this human part into their development because it's not about technology anymore. Think about what happens if North Korea's regime these days uses AI to have even stronger control over their citizens. Think about even the US. What happens, how do people use AI? And this can be very bad stuff. So I would love the young generation to be focused on what I call getting more values. Uh, learn about being ethical from founding a company. Set your values, what do you want to do? I'm never worried about technology. Technology will always evolve. I think that we have to find a way to keep control socially about the impact on us as human beings and also giving regimes in democracies and non-democracies kind of to limit their powers. So as you can see, the answer to my first question and also the second question, I'm trying to raise this thought that it's not about technology anymore. We as human beings, the eight billion people that we are today in this world, we've got to be more cautious about the quality of life, the inequality, uh, the, the non-balance that we may find between people. So ethical setting values to me amongst the young generation is probably the most crucial thing. So Technology is a tool that can be leveraged to solve problems. The, w one of the things I see so often in, in the, the blockchain world and, and the crypto space in general is people having, looking, using the technology to find a problem. But it, you should say, you first find what is the problem and see if that technology can help you solve the problem. You should, the, the key is what need is your product or service solving? Can this new technology help alleviate this problem in ways that couldn't have been done before? So we have um, patent pending technology that does leverage um, blockchain and, art and machine learning technology, but we started with a problem. We started with a core fundamental problem and then looked, 
how do we use these new technologies to create solutions that weren't possible before? So I just want to emphasize, don't, don't like get hyped around AI, blockchain, machine, you know, internet of things, biotech, like all these buzzwords. I, I think at the end of the day, they're, they're tools that can be leveraged to solve problems to, to cr create a better life for people with, with real needs. Thank you very much. Those are excellent answers. Um, we have a little bit more time in here, so I'm going to have a surprise question, okay? And um, the question would be, you know, there's more and more Chinese entrepreneurs here in the U.S. that we see, right? They're either kickstarting their companies or taking their company's IPO here. How do you think about this event? We have about eight minutes left, so I'd like to say, okay, one sentence for each person, starting from Lu. The question is that the more and the more Chinese entrepreneurs kick starting their companies in the U.S. How do you think about this event? I think it's, it's not a new thing. I was a tech entrepreneur. I started my company and sold it before I become an, I become an investor. So my friend always joke about I went to the dark side, the other side of the table. <laughs> but I'm like, it's lucky you guys have someone in the dark side to help support you with the capital. So I think there's not only Chinese, there are lots of immigrant founders in Silicon Valley. Among other unicorn companies, we have roughly 50%. 50% of the founder, they're immigrant. And there are more and more Chinese founder is actually doing their innovation in Silicon Valley. I think in general, it's definitely a good thing. And as I mentioned, in the future, the competition gonna be global competition. And the, the next great company gonna be a global company as well. So as a Chinese founder working in the United States, by nature, they have the advantages to have the global perspective, understand what is the best market application, what is the biggest market opportunity around the world. So I do see the big future for the Chinese founder, start their innovation in the United States, and the Silicon Valley definitely is the best place for innovation to get started. That's great, you've seen, <laughs> you speak my mind. But anyway, uh, I will speak in another way. I think um, if all these companies are ready, that's a good thing you know, for them to try this opportunity. But one thing that I would like to share is that what I experienced by myself, um, let me give you a very, very interesting story. Um, some, time, some years ago, um, one of my friends told me that actually now there are 10 companies who want to go IPO'd, you know, uh, would, would you please come and, you know, talk to them? And I said, oh, I'd love to, so I went there. So the first thing I asked the company is that, why do you want to go IPO'd? The 10 Chinese companies, you know, from about like nine provinces in China. I think most of them replied in a way that I was not surprised. They said, well, other people are going IPO, so we want to. So it's just a kind of like follow up of the trends. And then when I tell them that if you go IPO, probably you need to take care of your tax issue and blah, 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 blah. And those companies eventually, you know, for the whole morning, when I analyze you know, the advantages and disadvantages of going IPO, and for 10 companies, only one company left. For the other nine CEOs, they all left, and they said, no, we don't want to go IPO anymore. So that's the true story. I'm revealing the true um, phenomena that we've seen you know, in China. So anyway, um, what I want to say is that if you're ready, really, for, want to go IPO and to grow your business, and you understand why you want to do that, and then just feel free to do that. But if not, be careful. Anyway, this is what I want to share. Thank you. I don't distinguish between Chinese and others. So just about myself, I'm originally from Israel, and I took three companies public on NASDAQ, and I've done four M&As. So I remember when I started my first IPO, people looked at us, the Israelis, as a little bit, wow. But these days, uh, going public, whether it's in the US or Hong Kong or you know, the German uh, stock exchange or whatever, it's just another way, it's another stage, another layer in a company's involvement. About the Chinese, I would say that the only comment, and I visited China only twice, so I, I can't claim that I'm a big maven and I know what's happening there, so I'm very cautious. 
To me, every time a company from another country decides to go public or being acquired by an outside platform means that hopefully they will learn something from outside. So if trading on the stock exchange in New York can impact positively some of the culture, not just the greediness that unfortunately some investment bankers have, but if there are some things that, as far as values and other things that Chinese companies and entrepreneurs can learn from being public in the US, treating your customers in this way, treating your investor in a decent way, if they can learn these things, that of course I'm a pro going public. It's not such a big issue to go public if you have a great company that performs well. Much simpler than people think. No worries. Um, so, so yeah, my co-founder is Chinese, and I actually I previously started a, a crowd investing uh, company in China. My opinion on this is you, you just need to look at what each region can offer you. So in, in China, for example, you can have a cheaper development team. A lot of supply chains globally are monopolized in Shenzhen. That, those could be advantages for you know, certain industries you're interested in. In the Silicon Valley, you have a VC ecosystem that you can take advantage of. So I don't think it's a necessarily an either or, but rather looking at what, re what uh, each region can, can provide your particular business. Um, but more specifically to, to IPOs, um, actually until recently China required that you have three years of consecutive profitability before you could, could, could access the main capital markets. So that's just a very, <laughs> if you look at the IPOs here, they're, they're all, actually most of them lose money, like a lot of money. Slack loses money, Zoom loses money. Pinterest loses money. Actually, I think all of the ones that have gone uh, IPO'd have lost money. So those same companies could never go IPO in China. I mean, for a number of reasons, but the primary among them is they don't have that three years of profitability. So here in the US, they can access these uh, pools of capital, and there's an appetite for companies that currently don't lose money but have the potential to, to make a lot of money in the long term. So it's a very realist kind of <laughs> regulatory restriction. 我说几句啊，就是我们中美领导力发展基金会在国内呢，孵化了一个项目，叫透视四董会，就是为青年的创业家和企业家们经常定期或不定期的开四董会，帮助他们的成长。那实际上，在我们这四董会里面，大概有几